<laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. I was about to say happy Monday morning, but it's not Monday, is it? Um, welcome back. Uh, we're going to pick things up where we left off, left off on Monday with the nervous system. Um, got some new material for you today. Uh, I also want to apologize for canceling lab last minute yesterday. Um, I was chatting with, with, with you here before class. I'm still struggling with the stupid shingles. It's been like two months now and it kind of goes on and off. And uh, most of the time I feel pretty good, but then sometimes it just kicks in. So I apologize and try my best. I know a lot of people I talk to uh, are at the point now we're just kind of slogging through the rest of the semester, but we're going to do it. We're going to make the best of it. Uh, we got some cool stuff lined up and we will just pick up lab. Uh, next week's lab will be the skull lab that we were supposed to do this past week. The only real disadvantage I see is we're going to be offset a little bit because now the brain lab is going to be pushed back a week. And so the labs won't be synchronized with the lecture quite as well, but we'll be okay that we'll manage through. Um, so we've got the skull and the brain and then some more cat dissection labs coming up. Um, we've got five more labs to round out this semester. So apologize for that, but we'll get back on track and talk about the nervous system today. Yes, please. You will have the same lab quiz. Yeah, thanks for asking that too, Sarah. Uh, you will have the same lab quiz you're supposed to have yesterday. You'll have next week. So the upper, the muscles of the upper limb, uh, you'll have that same quiz uh, next week. So basically we do the exact same thing just a week later. So you get an extra week to study. How's that? Bonus. All right, so in advance of class today, uh, I think you had just a little bit of reading um, and we're watching a few a, uh, Crash Course A&P videos on the nervous system. We're gonna continue today talking about the nervous system generally uh, before we get into the anatomy of the brain soon here. I'm gonna start things off with a quick review activity. I wanna review your ticket out for Monday, make sure you've all got good understanding of uh, visceral motor, visceral sensory, somatic motor and somatic sensory um, neurons. Then I'm going to continue. We're going to talk about neuronal integration. So how signals uh, are, are move across the nervous system. I've got a cool human anatomy in the news segment for you today. And then to round things out, I want to just review topics you can expect to see on your quiz on Friday. Um, just an overview of what you should focus on studying and then update you with some schedule reminders. And I've got to take it out for you today. So a lot of items on that list, but they're all uh, they're all pretty short. So before we get to our review activity, uh, just don't forget you've got a study guide going with a lot of this material. Um, what questions do you have for me before we jump in? Dan. I have two questions. Two questions. You only get one today. It's not two question Tuesday. That was yesterday. It's one question Wednesday. It's, you have to be alliterative with it. Three question Thursday is tomorrow, but we don't have class tomorrow. Four question Friday. You could wait till Friday and just do four. You could do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so we were talking about that, like those two pictures of like the steps of how like, so this was associated with the slide about how the neuron dies, like a cell body dies. Mm -hmm. That's when it, that's when it permanently dies, but a peripheral neuron still has its cell body alive. It can repair itself. Uh, remember the key thing there is that if the cell body dies, uh, in almost all cases, that's it. The neuron is kaput. What can happen is if the axon gets damaged, that axon can get re uh, repaired. So mm. That's an important distinction. So if the cell body, regardless of what neuron it is, if that cell body has gone, remember the cell body contains uh, the nucleus, the bulk of the, the organelles in the cell. If that's gone, then no so, luck. But if that happens with the central nervous system, mm -hmm. like if an uh, axon dies, so it's, it's not going to repair itself like an act, if an axon gets damaged, so, yeah, it, they can they can to some extent repair themselves in the central nervous system as well. But again, it's it's not always fast or possible. Okay. It just depends. Yeah. Um, but with mm -hmm. those, like, do we have to know like the steps? Because there's like those pictures below. Like, oh, about. um, let me get back to you on that question. When we talk about what's covered on quiz four. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. And then the other question is about how we were talking about like white matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was just, we were talking about the tracks or commissures. Mm -hmm. but that was just, that's just the right and left. That's like associated. With yeah. So tracks are just bundles of these myelinated axons that travel through the central nervous system. And commissures are basically the same thing, but specifically in the brain when the left and right hemispheres communicate with each other. 
that's ahead of where we are right now. I kind of introduced it here, but we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to the brain. So it won't be, that won't be anything I'll ask you on the quiz on Friday. And you'll see those comma spheres and you'll see how that fits in the brain talks to itself or the other part of the brain, depending on what you consider the self, but that's a philosophical question for another day. Cool, good questions, Dan, thank you. Any other questions? Sweet. All right, let's do it. Quick review. So go ahead, grab some notebook, paper, whatever, and you're going to draw a grid that looks like this. I'll ask you, a, but you know, I actually wish I made this a little bit bigger, but make it big, like a, maybe half of a page or so even. Um, and then from memory, as best you can, uh, please, without consulting your notes, oops, sorry, um, go ahead and... Uh, spend one minute and list the four types of glial cells in the central nervous system and whatever you can about them. Try from memory first, and then we'll go and consult your notes as we normally do. Just a little bit to get your brain going on these cells again. Ten seconds left, whatever you can off the top of your head. All right, and let's skip ahead and now go ahead and take a minute and consult your notes and add any information to those. You've got yourself a nice little study guide now for the quiz. All right, well, I like that. I feel like you're boxing. All right, so we're going to come back to this topic in a little bit, but I uh, just wanted to refresh your memory on this. You can definitely expect a question on, on these cells on your quiz on Friday. So to take a, another little quick step backwards, on Monday, we had a ticket out asking a handful of questions. And I just want to make sure the majority of you got most of these right, um, but it's not, a, it's not an impressive majority. So I want to make sure we've got good understanding here. So this question asks you, which of the following is true? Uh, the correct answer is that sensory neurons transmit afferent signals, while motor neurons transmit efferent signals. So sensory is the same as afferent, and motor is the same as efferent. Uh, the red uh, has it switched the opposite, so that's not correct. The orange answer here, none of you picked, um, so don't worry about that. Um, this one is that they both transmit afferent signals, um, but that's not true. Only the uh, sensory neurons transmit afferent. So make sure you've got that down. Make sure you know afferent, efferent, uh, sensory, and um, motor. And there's an acronym to help you remember that, uh, but actually, well, I'll hold off on that. We'll get to that little mnemonic device in a second. Um, in which category is a nerve that senses how stretched or extended your stomach is? Most of you got this right. Since it's your internal organ, it's going to be visceral. And since it's sensing something, it's giving information, bringing it to your central nervous system, it's going to be sensory. So visceral sensory is the correct answer there. We did that activity in class where we all had different activities and you had to categorize them in one of these four uh, neuron uh, or message types. So just another example of that. That sound okay? Cool, most of you got that one. Most of you got this one too. In what category is a nerve that signals the muscles in your pyloric sphincter? So this is the sphincter, uh, the muscle that closes the, the passageway between your stomach and small intestine. 
Uh, so it's signaling that muscle to relax. So again, visceral motor, sending a signal from the central nervous system to a muscle, in this case, a muscle, a smooth muscle associated with the digestive tract. So it's going to be visceral. Um, another question, where are neuro, neuroglial cells found? Uh, the correct answer is this one. And this one, I wanna make sure we have a good understanding. Um, remember, neuroglial cells are found throughout. Those are, there's six types of glial cells, four types in the central nervous system, two types in the peripheral nervous system. That's kind of a broad term. If we talk specifically about neuroglial cells, that means central nervous system. Um, so they're not found throughout the peripheral nervous system. They are, in this answer, inside the neurons of the central nervous system. They're separate cells, so they wouldn't be inside another cell, right? There's, uh, the correct answer is they're associated with the neurons of the central nervous system. Um, and then I just made up another answer here in association with excitable motor neurons. Um, those would be, this would be part of the peripheral nervous system, remember, if they're motor neurons, so that wouldn't be that answer. So in association with neurons of the central nervous system. A couple important concepts to take away there. You need to know that neuroglia or neuroglial cells are specific to the central nervous system, and you need to know they're associated with neurons, not inside neurons or anything like that. Go ahead, Dan. So I just have two questions. Mm -hmm. so, um, in terms of the oligodendrocytes, are they like actually around the axons of the neurons? Mm -hmm. And they're and so what would the myelin be like? Just the fat they produce? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. It's 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 it. We we didn't really get into details, but basically they they fold their plasma membrane around the axon of the neurons in a way that, that insulates it. And so that's mm -hmm. going to be the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And, uh, Hold on. Mike has got a question. We'll come back to you. No, go ahead. Uh, is somatic motor, mm -hmm. um, is that like one voluntary muscles, like skeletal muscles? Yep, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dan, back to you. We'll come back to it, okay? I'm going to review this stuff uh, at the end of class too, so. Any other questions about what we've covered for Monday? You got it. Okay. So is there like an actual function of the Schwann cells? They produce the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Let's talk about some new material here. I want to talk about neuronal integration. Um, so can we come back to it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to review that, those topics. So we'll come back to it. Um, so uh, anatomically, we can define the central nervous system as different from the peripheral nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. Um, but what's important to remember is that even though we separate it anatomically, they're very closely integrated functionally. They, they work together. And so here we have afferent or sensory peripheral nervous system fibers carrying information to the central nervous system. Then in the central nervous system, we have these interneurons, which are receiving that information and doing stuff with it. They're transporting it to other places. And then we have these efferent peripheral nervous system fibers that are transmitting uh, motor outputs from the central nervous system to muscles and to glands. And so we have these things separated anatomically, but I wanna make sure we understand that they work very closely together functionally. And to give an example of this, I'm going to talk about something called a reflex arc. And we alluded to this earlier in class. Um, they are the simplest forms of this idea of integration. Uh, and they are, reflexes are defined as a, a non-voluntary response that happens in the absence of um, that signal, or, or I shouldn't say in the absence of, it, the response is initiated before that signal even reaches the brain. In other words, your, your brain is not involved. You can have a reflex arc even if that signal never gets to your brain. And there's five parts to this reflex arc. We have first uh, a receptor, something receives sensory information from, from the world or from your body. That information is then transmitted via sen a sensory or afferent neuron to the central nervous system. And here we have a cross section of the spinal cord just to refresh your memory, remember that there's gray matter uh, inside of white matter in the spinal cord. The gray matter is where we find these inter interneurons that I'll talk about in a second. The white matter, remember, is this tracks of these myelinated um, axons that are traveling kind of up and down through the spinal cord. So the sensory neuron delivers this information to this integration center, which in this case is just one interneuron uh, in the gray matter of the spinal cord. 
That interneuron then sends a signal to an efferent or motor neuron, which then um, communicates or sends a signal to the organ that's being effected, in this case, skeletal muscle. So five-step process for a reflex arc. It's the kind of simplest form of um, neuronal integration, whereby we're taking information from the world and we're doing something about it. I want to talk about that in a little more detail, but I want to give you that overall, um, the, the overall kind of uh, structure first. One quick thing to notice, I'll be right with you. you know, give me one second and I'll be right with you, okay? Oh, yeah, yep. <laughs> um, one quick thing to notice here is make sure you notice how these diagrams are structured. Um, if you see a circle here, that indicates the cell body. And when you see this, this indicates the, those terminal uh, boutons of the um, axon where that signal is transmitted. So notice here that this little cell body of the sensory neuron is up here. Remember, we talked about how the sensory neurons have their cell body. Uh, they have this unipolar structure here. And this is going to become important when we talk about the structure of the spinal cord. You'll see all of these cell bodies, these sensory neurons are clustered here just outside the spinal cord in something called the dorsal root ganglion. We'll talk about that in detail. I just want to explain why the cell body of the sensory neurons kind of just, and it's by its lonesome over here, but it's not by its lonesome. There's a whole bunch of other cell bodies of other sensory neurons with it. So it's, it's actually in, in really good company if you like hang out with sense cell bodies of sensory neurons. Cool, question, yes, Hannah. Um, can you still back one second? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. What I'm gonna do next is give two examples of reflex arcs, and that's about all we're gonna cover with it. I'm not gonna get into super great detail about integration. We'll save that for your, your, um, your neuroscience classes. Good here? It's a little text heavy slide there. I don't usually don't put that much text on it. Okay, so let's talk about um, what's called a monosynaptic reflex. This is the simplest type of reflex and it's called monosynaptic because there's only one synapse. So this type of reflex doesn't have that interneuron. It, it contains, it includes only two neurons, the sensory or afferent neuron, and the motor or efferent neuron. So this is even simpler than the simple diagram, the five piece diagram that I just showed you. So because it doesn't have an interneuron, it is the fastest kind of um, reflex. And a good example is a knee jerk reflex. So this is when you go to the doctor, we actually do this in lab busting. They, they um, hit this, this uh, tendon right here, just inferior to your patella and your leg kicks out. Um, and your um, and your leg kicks out, right? And so that's an example of this monosynaptic reflex. It happens very quickly. You don't control it. There's no conscious thought in there. Um, and uh, what it has to do with the reason, it seems like kind of a weird reflex for like, why, why does your knee, why does your knee extend when this patella or when this tendon is stretched? This is one of many reflexes that your body uses to maintain your balance, right? And so you're constantly getting this information from your joints and the tissue around your joints about how extended they are and where your body is in space. And you're constantly making adjustments so you don't fall over when you're standing, right? And so we don't think about any of this because often it's, it's reflex-based. Um, and so this allows us to maintain our balance. Like even if the ground is moving or unstable or there's wind blowing or things like that, we can just kind of stand there without thinking about it. Um, and the reason it's so important that it's a reflex because it has to happen quickly, otherwise you fall over. Like if you're, if you're something uh, affects your balance and it takes you a little bit too long to respond to it, well, then it's gonna be too late. And so we have a number of these reflex arcs in, uh, associated with the musculature of our legs, especially that help us maintain this balance. And this is one that's just kind of uh, obvious and, and easy to test. It's a monosynaptic reflex. Sound good? So there's no interneuron there? No interneuron, just one. In monosynaptic, one synapse. You have one synapse directly between that sensory neuron and that motor neuron. That synapse, that synapse is in the gray matter here, but okay. there's no there's no interneuron. There's just two neurons. And the synapse is just a predetermined response. Yep, so this sends a neurotransmitter. The sensory uh, 
the sensory neuron is the presynaptic neuron, sends neurotransmitters across that little synaptic cleft. Those are picked up by the motor neuron, which initiates an action potential down to here, in this case, your quadriceps muscle, your rectus femoris, which contracts the rectus femoris and extends your leg at the knee joint. Boom. Cool. Let's talk about uh, polysynaptic reflex. So these guys are more common. So we don't have too many of these monosynaptic reflexes, um, but we do have more of these polysynaptic reflex. And in this case, we do have this interneuron here. Um, and so you can off, you can sometimes even have more than one interneuron. I'm just going to show you an example with a single interneuron called polysynaptic because there are many polysynapses. In this case, there's two synapses, one between the afferent sensory neuron and the interneuron, and then another synapse between that interneuron and the motor or efferent neuron. So basically, we see the same structure here, only a little more complicated because we do have this interneuron. Now, and a good example of this is the withdrawal reflex. And you see an example here. I don't know if you can see very well. This is a tack. If you touch something sharp or really hot, your hand moves back before you're, you're, you kind of consciously even realize that you're experiencing pain. Um, and that's obviously, it's an important reflex um, physiologically for safety for obvious reasons. Like if something is going to injure you, you want to move back uh, as quickly as you can without, um, before you need to like think about, wow, this is hot. This is burning my hand. That's bad. I should move my hand. It just happens without you even thinking about it. So polysynaptic reflex. I want to dive in a little more and talk about integration. So I gave you an example here, this reflex arc. This has this really simple uh, inter integration uh, center here, which is just this single interneuron. This can, in fact, and in most cases it is, much more complicated. I'm not going to get into tons of detail about this in this class. All I want you to take away from this is there's lots of different ways that neurons um, create circuits and transmit information to each other. It's not simply one to one to one as it is in reflex arcs, but in most cases, it's actually a lot of stuff going on. And so some examples are here. One is what's called a diverging circuit where you see a single neuron at the top there, transmitting its information on an axon that actually splits to two other neurons. Those ones transmit information, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, you're kind of amplifying a signal. A signal from one neuron goes to two, then to four, then to eight, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a way for a single input to have an effect on many, many neurons and possibly many, many other effectors. And so, uh, you know, a good example of that, actually, you could think about the reflex arc in the sense that uh, the output here, you know, I'm showing you a simple output for you know, your biceps brachii here, right? But also, as you retract your arm, your uh, brachialis and other muscles are involved with that as well. So that signal does get split along the way here. So it's a little more complicated than that. Um, and that can happen through these diverging circuits. We can also have a case here where we have inputs from a lot of neurons going to a single neuron that has to get all of that information and then form an output. And so this is what's called a converging circuit where you have lots of inputs and one neuron providing the output. And then we can even make it more complicated with something called the reverberating circuit, where when this, the information kind of feeds back on itself, right? So you have information traveling here. This affects this neuron over here, which is integrating this information, which sends the signal back to here. Um, and this way, you can kind of synthesize and, and, and put various sensory input information together to form the proper, well, proper, form some kind of neuronal output. So just to recap, we have. Diverging circuit, one input, lots of outputs. We have a converging circuit, lots of inputs, one output. And then we have reverberating circuit where the information feeds back on itself. And that's all, that's all I want to talk about there. I just want to make sure you have the, the general idea of how these neurons are talking. About. <coughs> Questions? Yeah, again. Yeah. So the yeah, I mean, the gist of it here is that this signal is being transmitted from this neuron to this neuron, right? But then this neuron is also receiving information from this one over here. 
but that signal transmits here, but then also goes back here. So basically the information is kind of feeding on itself, right? And this is a way to like bring various sensory inputs together and, and synthesize information. So like one signal is going out and then there's a good amount of signal that's going back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like an example is, you know, if you're moving a joint, you're, as you move that joint, you're receiving new information about where that joint is now and how those tendons are stretched after you move it. And so you're kind of receiving that information that might change your output as you go through. So it's, it's basically a way to bring different information together. So it's getting, it's, um, there's an output occurring while you're getting input as well. Exactly, okay. yep, yep. Mm -hmm. True. And there's still only one input, one output. Oh, good question. For this simple reverberating circuit I'm showing here, yes. In reality, these things are all crosstalk and, and like interconnected, especially when we get up into your brain or something like that. So it would be many inputs, many outputs? It, it could be, yeah. It's going to be more complicated. I'm, I'm showing you simplified schematics of ways that neurons can be arranged. But in reality, all of those networks are some combination of all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so you've got a lot of these kind of circuits, for example, in your brain. So you can you can take complex information and process it together. Like if you see, you know, when you see an apple sitting in front of you, you've got input from your visual senses, you've got input from your tactile senses, you've got input from your olfactory senses, and all of that stuff comes together in your brain to be like, oh, that's an apple, you know. Um, and if some of those things, if there's a mismatch then you, that information is going to feed back on each other. Maybe it like, look, it, maybe it smells like an apple and maybe it, uh, but it looks like a orange or something. You're going to be really confused, right? So, I don't know, that's a bad example. You understand what I'm saying? That you, there could be a mismatch between those sensory things. Cool. All right, let's, uh, let me go back to our reflex arc. Um, and so I, we have this reflex arc here. So this is the withdrawal reflex which is the polysynaptic reflex arc. We have this interneuron here. Now I wanna just add another layer to this um, and, and show that in this case, this interneuron is also going to send, a, there's another interneuron that's going to send a signal up this white matter. Remember this white matter are these collection of these tracks of myelinated sheets of axons. This information up to some center in the brain that receives that information. So we have this signal, the reflex signal very quickly is going to pull your finger away from that match, but that's not all that happens. That signal at the same time is also sent to your brain so that you know what the heck is going on. So we have this immediate response via the spinal reflex, but then that information goes to their brain and says, you idiot, why'd you put your finger in front of that match, right? Now, once that signal gets back up to the brain, a little more happens, and let me pause here, make sure you've got this. And I'll show you one more diagram of how that's integrated up in the brain. So the withdrawal response happens independent of this neuron here in the central nervous system, right? This can happen even if something happened and this signal wasn't transmitted there. But at the same time, that signal is transmitted, sends a signal up to uh, integration center of your brain. Uh, I'm showing you a little bit more of the brain than we've talked about here, but you can see white and gray matter. In this case, the signal is being uh, sent to a part of the brain called the thalamus. And there, there's an interneuron in the brain that sends another signal to what's called your sensory cortex, which is the part of your brain that processes the sensory information from the, the external environment, such as touching a flame. Then there, uh, in the sensory cortex that receives that information, and there's an, uh, via this interneuron, that sends a signal to the motor cortex, which is the part of your brain that controls your voluntary motor activity. And via another neuron that then goes down this track, we get back to here, and that neuron sends another signal to the muscles of your arm. And in this case, the reflexes happen. You've pulled your finger away from that hot match. Your brain says, you idiot, you just burned yourself. What are we going to do now? Oh, you should probably put it under cold water. So you go and do that. And so in this case, you have this kind of two-step response, right? You have this first reflex response that happens immediately 
without you even consciously realizing it. But at the same time, that signal sent up to the brain where it's integrated and send back down. So you can then voluntarily and consciously decide on your next steps. In this case, hopefully running it under cold water or sticking it in a jar of mayonnaise or whatever you do. You don't do that. Actually, that's what you're not supposed to do. Yeah, mayonnaise is, is, can be cold if you keep it in the fridge, which I hope you do. Two things I want you to take away from today's class. Keep your mayonnaise in the fridge and don't stick a burned body part in mayonnaise. That's today's lesson. If you learn nothing else, take that away. And also how reflex arcs work. Okay, so the takeaway message here is we have the reflex arc and we have this more complex integration through the central nervous system. That's all I wanna cover of new material today. I wanna to give you a human anatomy in the news and then just review topics for the quiz. So let me just pause and see what questions you have about neuronal integration. The very quick 20 minute version of neuronal integration. Okay, uh, human, okay. So we've been talking about neuronal integration here about how your body receives information and transmits information. And we've talked about healing uh, as well. And what I wanna show you here are two, and actually have three examples of ways in which medical science is helping to amend uh, problems uh, with these systems. And so the first here is this guy in his twenties, I think in France, he fell off a balcony and it severed part of his spinal cord. And he, so he, and he's tetraplegic. He's able to move one of his arms a little bit, but he had no control over his arms and legs. And so what researchers did actually, let me show you this slide is they put implants. This is super cool. They put, um, sorry, let me just get this here. Uh, why can't you see that? Oh, come on. Do you see how the screen thing is going over my image? Here, let me just fix this real quick. Was it there? Yeah. Oh, typical. <laughs> All right, let's go here. Let's go here. Okay. Nope. There we go. Sorry about that. So what they did, this is a model obviously, but they cut through his scalp, they put these implants on uh, parts of his brain, specifically the motor cortex, so that a computer can read the neurons that are firing in this, this motor cortex. So they're electrical signals. So to be more specific, a computer can detect those electrical signals and then send that information to a robotic suit. And the computer and the user can then learn over time how to send the right signals and then the suit can respond and move them. So I'm gonna show you a demonstration here of what this guy is experiencing walking in this suit, right? Uh, it's pretty incredible. It's like a minute long, maybe. And so the important thing here is it's, he is controlling this robotic suit with his mind. It's not that the suit is just moving him and someone's there kind of controlling him. He's thinking about like, okay, take a step and the suit is taking a step. So obviously he's not gonna go out and take a stroll around the neighborhood just yet, but it is a pretty incredible kind of first step uh, in how we can integrate computers with our own nervous system to provide something like uh, the ability to move for someone who's tetraplegic in this case. So really cool stuff. Um, and a similar vein, this, so this would be taking uh, motor output from the central nervous system and transmitting it to a computer to control this motion, right? We wanna flip that the other way and think about how can we take information from the environment and integrate with sensory neurons input into the
the brain. And so a good example here is prosthesis. So folks that have had limbs amputated, they have, um, you know, technology and prosthetics has, has developed greatly in, in recent years. But the problem is they have no sensory input. So imagine like um, how, you know how weird it is if your leg falls asleep and then you stand up and you're kind of moving, but you can't feel your leg touching the ground and how difficult it is to maintain balance or to respond to the world around you if you don't have that sensory input. Well, they're integrating sensory input, computer-based sensory uh, sensors into prosthetics and then integrating that information into the nervous system. So you can actually feel that computer um, generated sensory input. So really cool advances on the other side as well to bring information from the environment into the central nervous system. The last example I have here um, is a recent study. They use a, a, a species of monkey. And what they did is they could actually use, they, they, um, they put implants in their brains and they could control robotic uh, fingers, robotic hands rather, and they could do it specifically, the, the breakthrough with this study was that they could do like one finger at a time. So in the past, they've been able to like just squeeze all the fingers together, but they could actually get to the level of control where they can move this finger or that finger. Um, so another advance in this. So as these things advance, uh, folks that suffer from uh, para or tetra, um, or para or tetraplegics or um, amputees or something like that will be able to regain a lot of uh, functionality. It's obviously in the early stages, but pretty cool stuff. So I put links to these three articles in your class program for Friday. Go ahead, bro. Okay. And that's, well, that's all I'm going to say about that anyway. So. Cool. So human, this will not be on your quiz on Friday. Your quiz material only covers what we did on uh, through Monday, but you can't expect a question on this on uh, future exams, for example. All right, I wanna do just a quick walkthrough of what you can expect on your quiz on Friday. Remember the quiz will be in class, so it'll be 20 minutes. If you're arranging to take the quiz at the testing center, that's perfectly fine. Just please schedule it such that you can be back here by about 20 after 10, so you can participate in the second half of class. Um, so I'm gonna go through these slides quickly. My intention here is not to present all of this material to you, but just to show you an overview of the topics that you can expect on the quiz. Um, having said that, the quiz is going to cover everything we've done since spring break, so I could ask questions that I'm not showing on these slides. My attention again here is to show you the main ideas and what to focus on for your studying. So we talked about the nervous system, um, including three main parts, sensory input, integration, motor output, make sure you know those. Make sure you know that sensory neurons are afferent neurons, motor neurons are efferent neurons. We got into more detail with this then, and we broke this down into somatic sensory, visceral sensory, somatic motor, and uh, visceral motor. And then we further broke down the autonomic nervous system just briefly into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. We'll actually talk about these in more detail when we get to the endocrinology section of cor the course, uh, which is the part I always enjoy teaching. Make sure you know the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, and all of this other stuff is the peripheral nervous system. So make sure you take a good look at this diagram and, of course, have a good idea. Uh, we spent a fair bit of time in class going over what, um, what information is being processed by visceral sensory, somatic sensory, somatic motor, visceral motor. Just to recall, remember that somatic sensory includes the special senses of hearing, uh, an equilibrium, hearing and balance in your ear and vision in the eye, whereas visceral sensory includes the special senses of taste and smell. We then talked about nervous tissue being composed of neurons and support cells. And we talked about how neurons are what actually transmit this electrical impulse called an action potential, bless you, to transmit information, but that support cells outnumber neurons by about 10 to one. Specifically in the central nervous system, those support cells are called neuroglia. We then talked in detail about those four types of neuroglia. So in the central nervous system, we have astrocytes and we have um, microglial cells here. Um, astrocytes uh, provide structure and support for the tissue generally. So you see that they have these um, branches associated with both blood vessels and neurons. Microglia, you can think of as the immune cells of the central nervous system. Um, we have the ependymal cells, which are epithelial cells that line 
the fluid filled cavities where we have cerebrospinal fluid. And then finally, we have these oligodendrocytes, which produce this insulating myelin sheath that wraps around the axons. So make sure you know those four cells, make sure you know generally what they do. We also talked about the two types of glial cells in the peripheral nervous system. You've got your satellite cells that provide structure and support, especially around the cell bodies. And then you've got these Schwann cells that basically do the same thing as oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and produce this myelin sheath. And so both of these you can see on this figure here. Question, yes. So my, what I was trying to ask, is there like an actual function of a satellite cell? Mm -hmm. They provide structure and support. They protect uh, the cell body. They make sure that the cell bodies like in the tissue where they are, are stabilized and, and where they need to be. Um, they can also provide, help provide nutrients and clean out waste products as well around there. So, so are they like the astrocytes the um, but, 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 but they are, they play a little more role than that too, but you can, you can think of them as more or less playing a similar role to what astrocytes do in the central nervous system. Yeah, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Brooke, did you have a question about this? You had a question before and you said yeah, you'll wait later. Okay, cool. All right, and we talked in detail about the structure of a neuron. Remember some key terms here, the cell body contains the nucleus as well as other important organelles. Um, we have these dendrites, which are these, um, the, the branches that come up and receive signals. And then we have the axon, which is the branch that generates impulses and conducts information away from the cell body. Remember, we've got this axon hillock is this, um, the, the origin of the axon where the axon starts and that's where the actual potential originates. And then we've got at the end here, we have these terminal arborizations and these terminal boutons, which is where um, neurotransmitters are secreted at a synapse. We talked about synapses as well. I don't have a slide for synapse. You should know what a synapse is and you should know what a neurotransmitter is in a very general sense. So just a pop quiz here. So this neuron is sending a signal down. It's it, this, the actual potential gets to the, the end of the axon here. A neurotransmitter is sent out into a synapse. What is going to be the postsynaptic cell here? What, what kind of cell might be receiving information from this neuron? There's many right answers. Another neuron, good. So it could be, uh, it could be an interneuron here, or it could be in, for example, a monosynaptic reflex arc where you have just two neurons, sensory and a motor. This could be the sensory neuron, although it's not structured like a sensory neuron, but let's just pretend it is. And then you could have a motor neuron receiving that signal. What else can receive a signal? Muscle. A muscle, good. And so if it's a skeletal muscle, um, what kind of neuron is this? Somatic, somatic, motor. somatic motor, good. If it's a smooth muscle, let's say of the digestive tract, what kind of uh, neuron is this? Visceral. Visceral motor, good, good, good. And then what other kind of, um, uh, what other kind of tissue can receive signal from a motor neuron? Glossic gland, yep. So for example, you send a neuron to the glands that produce sweat and we got some sweat. Cool. All right, and then we've, we got into the structure of a nerve. Remember that a nerve and a neuron are not synonymous. Rather, a nerve is a bundle of axons of neurons. Make sure you know that the axons are wrapped in myelin sheath, which is then wrapped in this uh, connective tissue called endoneurium. We have these bundles called fascicles that are wrapped in perineurium. And then a whole bunch of those fascicles together, along with blood vessels that are wrapped in epineurium. Remember that structure is the exact same uh, as we saw with muscle as well. So make sure you know those terms. We also talked about white versus gray matter. Uh, make sure you know generally what is um, what each of these consists of. So gray matter is short, uh, non-myelinated interneurons. It also contains the cell bodies of interneurons and motor neurons, and of course, neuroglia. Neuroglia are everywhere. And then the white matter is these fiber tracks, these long myelinated uh, uh, axons of um, different, both motor and sensory neurons, also contains neuroglia. So importantly, notice that both uh, gray and white matter contain neuroglia. Uh, again, just to remind you that what we covered in class today, neuronal integration will not be on the quiz. I generally don't like to have quizzes on material that would just cover the class before. It doesn't really give you proper time to digest it. 
So we'll cover what we co we've covered uh, today. It's quite a bit on the nervous system. It's a lot there. Perfect timing to wrap up class here before I give you a couple other reminders and your ticket out. What questions do you have? Dan's got a question. So um, it's, it was saying how uh, gray matter is mostly on the inside. That's only just for the spinal cord. Uh, gray matter is internal in the spinal cord uh, and white matter is external. In the brain, uh, it's also true that gray matter is internal, white matter is external, but then you have this other layer of gray matter on the outside of your brain. We'll get to that next week. Mm -hmm. And that's that's your the cortex. So that's like the motor cortex where we saw those implants um, in the human anatomy in the news segment. Um, that's gray matter on the outside of the brain. We'll get to it. Mm -hmm. Make a... um, is it going to be similar to the Yeah, and I have details about the format of the quiz in your class program for Friday. Your class program just includes these um, human anatomy in the news uh, articles and then details about the quiz. And so multiple choice, uh, some long answer. I'll definitely have a long answer. Um, I'll probably have a long answer, open-ended question about something about glial cells in the central nervous system. Um, and then I might have some kind of drawing activity as well, but yeah. Same, same general format. All right, so just come reminders. The quiz is Friday. Remember, it's in class, closed book, et cetera. Remember that next week, Friday, April 1st, is going to be your second lecture exam. No, third lecture exam. Second or third? Why'd I put three there? Hmm. None of you can answer that question. Uh, sorry, second lecture exam. Um, it's going to be in Blackboard, open book. I'll share details of the format, um, more of those next week. Remember that this will cover lots of topics, muscles, skull, and the nervous system. It'll cover everything we, we um, get to up through next week, Monday. And then just a reminder, I've said this a bunch of times, I wanna make sure everyone has that new date for your final lab practical on your calendar. Otherwise, I've got a ticket out for you. Just upload your review from today and answer a couple questions. Note that these questions are questions that may appear on your quiz uh, in identical or very similar format. So if you're not sure of the answers to these questions, go ahead and, and save this, uh, take a screenshot of the question and, and go look up the answers because you'll need to know this stuff. I'll stick around if you have any questions as usual.